Um, so these weeks we've been uh, expressing different aspects of God's will, and um, we saw that there are two parts for everyone in this world, believer or unbeliever. There's a part of darkness that leads to more and more darkness, and there's also a part of light which, and righteousness which leads to more and more light. Um, we saw the house of God. We, we, we spoke about the house of God and how it's the Lord's intention when He calls every saint, every child of God, His purpose for them is to become a house, a dwelling place for God, individually and also as a church, as a corporate body. It's impossible for someone to live for God by themselves. And Paul addresses this very strictly in Hebrews. Do not neglect gathering together. I mean, you cannot walk with God. We cannot walk with God alone. Um, we saw uh, the seed, about the seed of faith. And now from the very beginning, God has worked to preserve His seed, His word, His plan in the lives of His people. And He has been watching that seed from generation to generation for 6,000 years up until now. And we see that seed gave birth in Christ. He was the promised seed, the promised son. And also... Um, that seed was first Christ. He was the Son that God had foreseen before the foundation of the world, and through Him God began to create everything. But also, it wasn't just Christ, because in Ephesians, when Paul is addressing the subject about the plan of God, the counsel of God, and everything was in Christ, formed within Christ first, he says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So it was not just Christ in God's mind, but it was the church. It was His bride. And that's why He pictured it perfectly in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve. God gave us a picture, a prophetic picture in the life of Adam and Eve, what He wants and what He desires. And the reason He created all of us. Amen. And that's going to give us some uh, meaning in life purpose in life. We've been called the bride of Christ to be given to Him. A bride is given to her husband. He, she's totally His and He hers. Amen. They become one in will, in desire, in uh, perfect, to become perfect union. You know, clash. That's Christ and the church. Amen. And we saw also about seeking the Lord. It's a time for us to seek God because of what He is about to do. It's not going to be done in human strength because that seed, yes, it was Christ, but we see another seed coming to be born in Revelation chapter 12. That is the woman giving birth to the male child, which is also the promised seed that will crush the head of the serpent. That's us. That's the church. When we become to the unity of the faith and of His knowledge, to the maturity of Christ. Amen. And so we've kind of like we're covering a spectrum of uh, to give us vision, to give us understanding where we are, what we're doing in this meeting to build faith inside. Amen. To build faith inside. Um, and so this afternoon I want to speak more specifically on uh, we're going to read Ephesians 5. Verse 15, and we've got the scriptures on the screen. Um, so Paul is speaking to the church of Ephesus, and here's what he says. He says, look carefully, then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says, we must walk wise. Why? Because the days are evil. We're living in evil days. That's 2,000 years ago, Paul speaking. How much more now? Amen. How much more now? And that's why he says, therefore, because of this reason, it's evil days, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
understand the will of the Lord. That's how we can walk with wisdom in the crooked generation. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so I want to talk today about the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord. Now, for one, uh, God gave us the book of Revelation uh, and all the prophetic word so we can understand the times and the seasons that we live in. Very important for our faith to know what His plan is and what He is doing, what He will do. Um, again, the seven churches, as an example, they portray seven periods of time, seven years of church history, um, with different messages, different exhortations, different instructions, how to overcome, different corrections, how to navigate their time and how to overcome their time. Different for every generation. Now, in our time, we see the two signs. The woman, again, the agony of giving birth. That's, the, that's becoming the condition of the church slowly throughout the world. The condition of the church is this agony to bring forth something that God desired from the very beginning. And the, re the real move of God, the real move of the Spirit that we see in the book of Acts, that was the beginning, which Satan destroyed, now God's rebuilding again. So first, before you rebuild, what do you need? Foundation, okay? We've lost the foundation. Apostles, prophets, the revelation of God's Word, Christ, who Christ is, that's the foundation of the church. Okay, that's lost. What do you do? Bring them back out from the darkness, Bring them back to the foundation first. So God is re-establishing the foundation, the knowledge of who He is. That's first. And then He's restoring up, restoring back apostles, prophets, the fivefold ministry. Amen. And when that foundation has been rebuilt, God has a platform in which He can build His house. And so that's what we're doing now. We're coming back to our roots so God can finish the work. So in our time we see the, the woman, she's wants to give birth and also the great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on the seven heads that is speaking of the antichrist system the one world government that is being formed right now right now and will come to power in some measure before the rapture there will be one revealing of the antichrist before the rapture um, so two kingdoms are forming Light, darkness, Christ, Antichrist, God, Satan. Amen. Mm. Um, and that's why he says the days are evil. The days are evil. But know the will of God. Know the will of the Lord. So if we go to Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 14. Um, <clears throat> again, he's Paul addressing the church of Ephesus. He says, we know, we know this. We should know this off by heart, I believe. But I want to address a different, uh, something different now. He says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. Amen. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, but look how he continues. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So these ministries, the ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they're given to bring the church to the maturity of Christ. Amen. Mm. So that we may no longer be children. The wind blows, wind, wind blows it, we go this way. Whatever someone says, we go this way, we go this way. No, no. We need stability in our walk with God. And that is the maturity that Paul is speaking about. So, okay. First, to become to the stature of Christ, to the maturity of Christ, we have to understand how Christ lived. So that we can imitate Him. Amen? Christ is the end goal. <clears throat> for us, for our life. He's the pattern son, the blueprint of the perfect son that God wants to form.
conforming, each one of us. That's why we have his spirit. Um, so we're conforming to that image and his way. Now, how Christ lived. How Christ lived. Uh, if we see in Luke chapter 2 and verse 46, it says, this is from Yahweh. Now let's start in the, in the beginning we see after his birth. The next time we see him as a 12 years old. After three days, they found him, his, uh, Mary and Joseph, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. This is Jesus at 12 years old, learning the word of God. And all who heard him, they were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother <laughs> said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Notice what he says here. Twelve years old. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I must be about my father's business. I must be. It's a must in my life. Twelve years old. That's the, that's the pattern we need to follow. The life of Christ. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. He, he's twelve years old here. Why do we see him at twelve years old? Because at twelve years old, we, we, we've spoken before. It's the age where a Jewish boy would come to the age of accountability. He's now accountable. He can make more decisions as a young man, and he can choose whether or not to continue in his study of the law. To become a child of the law in their in that, that that was God, God's culture and so he 12 years old he's making a decision that's why his family goes and he doesn't go with them he's choosing to continue his study of the law because I must be in my father's business I must be um, now 12 years old what does it speak of no, sorry 12 the number 12 Completion in the kingdom. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, okay? Now, when do we enter the kingdom of God? When? When we accept Jesus. True, Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. When you're born of water and you're born of the Spirit, that's the baptism, and you repent, you accept the gospel, you receive Christ, the Word, that is life and Spirit, you enter His kingdom. So, when you enter the kingdom of God, when you're born again, you're the born again experience, what do you need to be saying? What do we need to be saying? I must be about my father's business. Amen. Is it a must? Has it become a must to you, to me? Amen. That means the moment he calls you, you hear his calling in your life, you respond with all your heart. Simple faith. Doesn't cost money. You don't need to by God, is what I'm saying. And Peter actually rebukes this when someone wanted to buy the gift of God. But he wants what? Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, soul, strength. That's spirit, soul, body. He wants you. He wants me. When he calls you and you are born again, you enter his kingdom. Now, I must be about my father's business. That's the beginning. Amen. And that's the pattern we're seeing that Jesus at 12 years old. Now I'm making my decisions to follow my father. Amen. Did Jesus have a father? Yes. Did Jesus have a God? No. Amen. Amen. And you followed him. That's why the scripture says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart like the rebellion. Amen. Amen. So, Jesus lived 
with this purpose. That was the mind of Christ. A part of it was to follow my Father, to do the will of my Father, to be about His business. Amen. And in Luke 4 and verse 42, it says, no, we didn't, I didn't put it. Uh, it here's Jesus. He says, um, the scripture says, when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and they came to him and, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, so the people are coming and Jesus said, no, I've got to go. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. You see, he was consumed with the purpose of God. I must go and preach in this town, in this town, because that's what God was revealing to him to do. Amen. I must be. And in John 4, 34, I didn't put it, he says, speaking about the, speaking of the woman of Samaria, when the disciples came to him, he said, why are you talking with this woman? He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his works. That was within Christ. He had to accomplish and fulfill what God had given to him. Amen. Must be. The will of the Lord. Amen. That's the example we have in Christ. And that's why Jesus had stability in his walk with God. He was not tossed to and from. Imagine how many winds were blowing in Christ's life. Hey, we want you to become king. Hey, I'll let you, never let you go to the cross. Come here, there. Many winds are blowing in Christ's life, but he had stability. No, no, that's not my time. No, that's not my time. I have to go this way. Because he knew. How? By the revelation of God, of his word. That's how. See, God gave us an example in, in, in Exodus, how the people of God are supposed to live. Not from yesterday's bread. Every day, they had to go out and gather a new manna every day. And what was the lesson that God was giving to his people in, by doing that? In Deuteronomy, he says that you will learn, that you will understand that man doesn't live, have life from the physical, from bread, physical, but by, the, by all that comes from the mouth of God. Mm. He says all, all. And Jesus interprets that. In the Greek, he says by the rima. You see, it's the word spoken. And it's the spirit. And that's how Jesus lived, by the rima of God. God, as he was praying every morning, he knew the word, studied the word, and the Lord would breathe in Christ, speak the word to Christ, and receive revelation. And that's how he was able to, to know, no, no, I'm not going to Lazarus now, waiting for him to die, because God revealed that to him. To not go, quickly, let's go pray. And so that's the relationship that Jesus had with the Father and wants to bring all of us into. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the maturity of Christ. Not tossed. Stability. To know the will of the Lord. Amen. Now, here, uh, and then next, in John 17, 4 and 5, he, look, look, look at this example. When Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, I glorified you on earth, speaking to the Father having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That's how Jesus glorified God, by doing what God had given him to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. But I thought Jesus was 33 and a half years old saying this prayer. What, what glory did you have in before the foundation of the world? See, Jesus understood that all of God's will had already been finished before the foundation of the world. That means that he knew he had already been glorified by God before the world existed. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So, remember, in Daniel chapter 7, it speaks of the, the vision. It's a vision of four beasts, speaking of the Babylon, the Medo-Persian, Greeks, Roman, Antichrist. It's the whole future of the 
Antichrist kingdom or the demonic kingdoms that will form on the earth. And then we see the kingdom of Christ. And we see it in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. It says, I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days. The son of man is coming to the ancient of days. One, two. Amen. Amen. And was presented before him. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, there's the glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. It had already been done. Jesus had already been glorified before the foundation of the world. And Jesus reads this scripture and understands, Father, you have already glorified me before the foundation of the world. That's his glory in the word, the logos. Amen. Now, does the same hold true for us? Have we been glorified before the foundation of the world? Amen. Where? Where? Where do we see? Because see, the Word brings faith. The Word brings revelation in the heart. We see in Revelation chapter 4, we see a vision. John is taken up in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Okay? And he sees the throne of God. And one said, on the throne. And what does he see around the throne? What does John see around the throne? 24 elders. Elders. And 24. What are they sitting on? Are they standing, dancing? Oh, thrones. They're seated on thrones with wreaths of gold on their head. The wreath speaks of the victory. Who are the elders? The church. The bride of Christ. 24. 12 Old Testament, 12 New Testament. It's the fullness of the kingdom of God throughout the history of God. Old and New Testament. God has already glorified us in His presence. He's seen it and He's pictured it for us. Amen. We've already received it. The glory on that's the throne. Amen. So, Jesus lived with this faith. That's why he said, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he saw God's plan for him. Amen. He saw his resurrection, his glorification. Why is that so important? Because in Hebrews it says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God throne of God. So, because of that joy, that God would not allow him to see corruption but would glorify him, he was able to endure his cross. The same goes for us. Amen. Um, now we see in John 19.30 when Jesus received the sour wine, this is on the cross, what was what the, his last words? He said, it is finished. It's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That means that his whole life, this was in the mind of Christ, to do and to fulfill the will of God. Mm -hmm. That's why his last breath, of anything he could have said, it's finished. He did exactly what God gave him to do. Amen. He finished it mm -hmm. perfectly. That's the example that we have in Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <clears throat> how can we know His will? First, we must know His word. Mm -hmm. Remember in Psalms, He says, Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Mm -hmm. The word reveals plan of God, the purposes of God. Amen. Um, by the revelation of the word in the heart of a person, that's very important. 
because in Psalm 119 and 130, maybe I've got it, it says, the unfolding of your word gives light. So yes, the word is the light, but the word must open, reveal. That's when it gives light to you. That's when you know the path that you have to walk. And it imparts understanding to the simple. And so when you're seeking God, the word begins to open and it releases a spirit of revelation. You can perceive the calling he has for you. Nancy has for you. Amen. In day to day, living, and also more. More. In Psalm 25, 9, 12, and 14, it says, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. So there we need humility. Amen. We need to be humble before God. Not my way, his way first. In verse 12, it says, Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. There's another key, the fear of the Lord. To turn away from evil. To uphold God's word as holy. Amen. That's where God can release revelation. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known his covenant to them. The secret counsel, the mysteries of God, reveals to those whose heart is in that right place, that with the fear of the Lord. So it must be humble. Um, now, the Spirit of God, just a quick, quick, yeah. The Spirit of God, we saw in Demi's teaching the other day recently, it's pictured as an almond tree, right? That's the, in the, sorry, in the seven golden lampstand. It's an almond tree. Um, you've got the trunk in the middle, trunk of the tree, it's the spirit of Yahweh. And then you've got three branches and three branches. That's seven spirits. That's the fullness of God's spirit. Amen. Pictured as an almond tree because on the lampstand it was full of almond blossoms, which speaks of resurrection. Now, the beginning is in Isaiah, it says this spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Starts with wisdom, ends with fear. But the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So you see God's Spirit, it's, He shows the whole spectrum. I mean, there's a process to how God's Spirit works in our life. I mean, it's beginning to end, or end from the beginning. That's how God works. So, um, that's the heart that we need to develop inside in order to perceive the light, to receive the light and revelation of God for His will and His purpose in our lives. Amen. Amen. And it says, He reveals His covenant, His secret counsel. So, remember Judas Iscariot, on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, when they were at the Passover, and Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And He spends three chapters in John, Revealing the covenant to them. Who was missing? When Jesus is revealing the new covenant to them, teaching them about the Holy Spirit, the walk of God, overcoming the world, and so on. Who is not there? Judas. Judas is not there. He missed out. You see? The heart was in the wrong place. He missed the covenant. But when the heart is in the right place, Revealed to you. Amen. Mm -hmm. So the condition of our heart it matters. And when we surrender His will, to, we surrender to His will and we respond with faith, simple faith. Amen. And God begins to reveal more prophecy, dreams, through prayer, as we are responding to the will of God, the Word of God. Amen. I'll give an example from my own life. So one time God woke me up, middle of the night. And I began to pray, began to read the word, and um, God began to talk to me through the word about what He would do in my life. And I, I received it, I received it about seven years ago. So kneeling on the floor, reading my Bible at midnight, and I felt God revealing His word to me. Okay, I prayed over it, put the book, book down, went back to sleep. That night I had a dream about the scripture that I was just reading something that would happen way in the future. 
So, you see, as we are uh, responding to God, because at that point, I was already walking and doing God's will. We're not, we're not perfect, but I was studying. I was sharing the Word of God with whoever I could, family, friends, church. got rejected a lot. But I kept a steady walk. I, I kept as steady as I could. And there was the revelation of God's will. And that goes for every one of us. Amen. Amen. How to know the will of God? Matthew 10 and verse 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. There. This is the key. To lose your life in this world. And then you will find it. You will discover the life of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so Jesus calls the disciples. Peter, Andrew, brothers, fishermen. Right? What does he say? Follow me and you will be catching men. You will become fishers of men. What did they do? How did they respond to the calling? Okay, Lord, we'll come, but let us, you know, finish our fishing for the day. Let us sell the fish that we caught. And, you know, maybe we've got to sell the boat. Is that how they responded? You know what the scripture says about Peter and Andrew? It says, immediately, they left everything. And they began to follow the Lord. The same with James and John. He says, leave your fishing business. And start to follow me. Kingdom business. What did they do? Again, it says immediately they left everything. Their father, the boat, the business. And they began to follow the Lord. Matthew. He's at the tax collecting office. The RTO. The Roman tax office. And he says, Jesus says, follow me. And how did he respond? Again, it says he left it. Amen. There you will find the will of God. When you say, Lord, I lose my life for your sake. There you find life, the plan of God, the purpose of God, why we were created. Amen. Um, and he gives them an assignment. You are chosen to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's what he tells us to. Amen. So the more we deny ourselves, the more we find the will of God. Amen. Mm. Now, God brings Israel out of Egypt. Okay? They come out from Egypt. <clears throat> he gives them the tabernacle. He gives them the priesthood. His goal was to bring them where? Into promised land. God had a goal for them where they were going to end up in the promised land. And Canaan was full of giants and enemies and war. And so he wants to take them to that land to take it for themselves, to take it for God. Amen. And he's called us to do the same when we come out of Egypt, the world, through the desert, which is also this life, the picture of this life, to enter the war, to enter the battle, to destroy the works of the enemy, of the devil, to set the captives free, to bring the power of the gospel to the broken heart, to take lands, communities, lives that have been occupied by demon spirits. This is our calling, to take back souls for the kingdom of God. Amen. And between Exodus, which is Egypt, the scene of Egypt, and Numbers, which is the when they were first called to go to the promised land. Okay? Exodus, Numbers. Out of Egypt, into the promised land. Even though they didn't then. What do we have between? What do we have between coming out from the world and entering the promises of God? What's in between? No. What book? 
Yes. Leviticus. Leviticus. The calling. That's what Levi means. The, the, it has to do with our calling. Be connected to God. What is Leviticus? The law and the sacrifice. And it starts with the burnt offering. <laughs> Amen. Before the battle, we have to lay our life down mm. and do it every day. It's every day. Decisions, small or big, mm. surrender them to God every day. Mm. Then we used for the battle. Mm. Amen. Amen. In Hebrews 10 and 5 to 7, it says, Consequently, when Christ <coughs> came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not decided, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the book, in the scroll of the book. So you see, he says, your, your delight is not in the lambs and the bulls and the goats, but your delight is in what? A body. A living sacrifice. The will of man. To submit to God's will. Amen. That is the true <coughs> sacrifice that God is delighted in. That is the will of the Lord. To become the living sacrifice. To say, Lord, I live my life and I follow you. Follow the will of God. Amen. That is the pattern that we see in the life of Jesus Christ. Now in Colossians chapter 1, 1 verse 9 to 10. It says... From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. That was the desire of the apostles, to see the church growing in the knowledge of God's will. Why? In all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. When we know the will of the Lord, we can walk in it. We can be pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen. How can we please God? It says, without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God. How do we please God? Through faith. faith. Through faith. That's how we please God. How do we receive faith? Through the Word. By the revelation of the word in the heart, when you hear, Amen. Amen. The word. Now, we have, and praise God for confirmation too, when we were um, praising, three million people said, "It's not for us to take the land. Look at the size of them. Look at the size of us. We cannot." What did Joshua and Caleb say? Let's go at once and occupy that land because God promised it to us. Amen. That's the difference between the multitudes and the two. It's the revelation of the word in the heart. In the heart. Amen. And Jesus said the same thing to the, to the disciples. Same picture we see in Matthew 10, Matthew 13, 10 to 16. It says, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, well, why do you speak to them in parables? Why are you speaking to the multitudes this way? In parables, metaphors. Mm -hmm. He said to you, to the disciples, it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The mysteries. But to them it's not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear. The same with the three million. They saw, but they didn't see. They heard, but they didn't hear. Mm -hmm. But Joshua and Caleb, no, no, it was revealed to them in the heart. And that's why when it's revealed to them, to you in the heart, what did they do? We're going to walk in it. We're going to do it. 
Amen. That's how you can do it. That's how Christ did it. Because he was in the heart. He came in the heart. And he accomplished the will of the Lord. Amen. That's how we must know it. By uh, revelation. I say that because it has to come in the heart. It has to come in the heart. Amen. Become one with you. That's why Jesus said, I must be in my father's business. Not Mary told me I had to do this. Joseph told me. No. I must be. I choose this. That's why 12 years old. He's choosing now. What do That has to be our heart, our will. Amen. And it says, we continue, so they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For, for this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Unless they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, I will heal them. And then he says to the disciples, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So the, the, he says, they cannot see, because the heart is dull. And it means that. The heart is full. They cannot allow anything else to enter in. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus said, don't let the cares of this world, the things of this world, weigh the heart down. Mm -hmm. The word cannot come in, cannot bring growth. And also sin. And also sin. Makes the heart <coughs> unfeeling, unresponsive to the word. And many turned away from the Lord because of his words when he was speaking his will to them. But the disciples said, Lord, you have the word of eternal life. Where else would we go? What did they do when he called them? From the, from the, the, the fishing boat, what did they do? They left all of them. Everything. They left everything. Where would we go? We don't have the business. We sold the business. I already told my father. But to the three million, when they were before the gate of the promised land, what did they say? What did they say, the three million and the ten spies? Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They were not dead to Egypt yet. Egypt was still in the heart. That's why they couldn't receive the revelation mm -hmm. of the promised land. But to Caleb and Joshua, no, no, no. We're not going back there. We're not going back there. I want what God gave to me. The point of no return. Mm -hmm. That's when Jesus said, if you lose your life, there you will. Fine. Fine. Amen. Mm. Do we want the maturity of Christ? Mm. Amen. Mm. We must live for the will of God, leaving the childhood behind. No more toss to and fro. But we are sure of God's will. Amen. And becoming sure because it's the growth. Amen. Mm. Um, but you say, well, when I'm not an apostle. You know, I'm not a prophet. What if, what if I told you, what if I told you that we've got some people coming here next week and they're going to start coming to the group, you know, a group, and uh, I need you to, we need you to set up a table and serve them food. How would you respond? Yes. Yes. You say, oh, okay, yeah, I can do it. How would it affect you inside? I'll explain. So, would you see there's something given by God as something of purpose, as something for the will of God to set up the table and to serve people that come? Because we need to stop thinking what looks big is big to God. No. No. And I was like, saying to Michael the other day, whenever I think of Irene or Vassal looking after Sophia, you know, that frees up my time to, to minister, to Bible study, these things, 
I always remember the story of David when David and his men went to the war and some stayed behind and looked after the luggage. And, you know, they brought back spoils. And the people said, these spoils are for us, not for them. They didn't go to the war. And David said, no, the people that look after the luggage and the people that go to war, they share the spoils together. And that's the heart of God. That's why he says, if you just give a cup of cold water to a little one, because they're on the inside, you do it for me. And you will receive your reward. So we need to stop thinking what looks big is big. No. Mm -hmm. Amen. It counts. It counts. So Stephen is asked by the apostles and the, the elders, we want you to serve tables. That's your ministry right now. And he was full of faith. That's the word of God, the will of God, full of the Holy Spirit. And what did he begin to do? Serving tables. Great wonders great signs among the people. Amen. We're talking about the will of the Lord. How we receive the will of God in our heart. When God appoints us to do something, how are we going to do it? Oh, yeah, David. Let's imagine Stephen doing that. No. No. But he took every opportunity that's what was in his heart. Now, think, picture it. He's at the tables. He sees this widow, because they were widows. And God loves you. And, you know, he heals the broken heart. He binds up the wounds. You know, Do you have anything I can pray for? Are you sick? In Jesus' name, heal. Oh, she got healed. Hey, can you pray for me? Okay, yes, of course. In Jesus' name. Great wonders, signs are doing, are happening. I mean, because he's taking the opportunity that God gave to him to minister, to pour out himself, to pour out the love of Christ. Amen. And God is able to use that person. So we're not waiting for something over there 10 years in the future. No. We do every single day, every opportunity, the person sitting next to you on the train. I met another boy on the train this week and I began to speak to him. He was reading a book about how to come closer to Jesus. And I said, hey, you're a Christian. And we started speaking and he asked for my number. He asked about their missing. Maybe there's an opportunity there. Yeah. It's just opening, expressing yourself. Mm. Amen. Amen. To do the will of God. And eventually you find yourself doing more specific, more things. Amen. But you start every day where you are. Mm. Amen. And we have two chapters in the book of Acts dedicated to Stephen's testimony. Because of his spirit. Amen. Amen. To do the will of God. And... God used his death to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth because the apostles were comfortable in Jerusalem. But after his death, they started to spread and the gospel spread throughout the earth. Amen. Because he served tables with purpose for the will of God. Amen. And how did people ceased and coming to a close now. How did people see Stephen's face? When he remember he was standing before the council of the priests? Mm. How did they see his face in the congregation? Like what did he look like? Like a what? Like an angel. Like an angel. Mm. What does angel mean in Greek? Messenger. Messenger. One who conveys the message of God to the people. That was within the heart of Stephen. Mm. I am a messenger of God. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And what was inside was expressed outside. Mm -hmm. To whatever capacity, whatever means it is, live with this purpose. You are called to bring the kingdom of God wherever you are. To be His vessel, His messenger. Amen. Mm -hmm. To do the will of the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you.